It's Andre from the High Performance Academy and we're here at World Time Attack 2015. We're here with Cole from Life Motorsport and unfortunately we're joining Cole on what's turned out to be a reasonably bad day for Life Motorsport all the way from the US and unfortunately this, this GDR that we've all been looking forward to seeing run, you've already had an engine problem in today's first session. Uh, I want to point out to everyone viewing here that when you're competing at this level, when you're trying to push the engine this hard, unfortunately sometimes mechanical problems do occur and there's no real disrespect in that. We're still going to take the opportunity though to go over this car because so many people are interested in finding out about it. Can we start Cole by uh, giving us a rundown on the electronics package inside this R35 GDR? Yeah, absolutely. We have uh, we run the MoTeC M150, the plug and play ECU with an ADL3 dash as well as a PDM. Uh, custom built wiring harness uh, from Cody Phillips Racing. And uh, it's all, it's complete MoTeC system. Uh, we have shock pots on all four corners, brake pressure sensors on all four corners. So uh, we're able to really develop the aero package and pu pull a lot of crucial information out of it. Uh, with the with the cars as they're getting more and more complex these days, particularly with the CAN integration between different modules, it is getting harder and harder uh, to replace the factory ECU as something standalone. It's interesting you're still using a plug and play uh, ECU in this car, so are you still retaining a lot of the factory wiring harness? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we have to out of. Uh Necessity. I wish Motec had a transmission control unit that we could do and have it that standalone as well. But um, uh, Nissan did a really good job in the very beginning of getting the electronics to work around the factory transmission, and uh, we can't find a better solution. So uh, we're running the factory TCM, and the plug and play gives us the ability to do that and have a quite a bit more control than we would otherwise. Uh, running a car at, at this level and pushing this hard, uh, you're really relying on that data analysis as well. So you said you've got the uh, Motec ADL3 dash, was it? Yes, that's correct. And what sensors, you mentioned you've got shock pot sensors, but can you give us a, uh, a sort of a more thorough rundown on exactly what sensors you've got on the car? Uh, well, shock pots is the big one, and that's really crucial for developing the aero package. Uh, brake pressure sensors, they come into play, but uh, n not nearly as much as shock pots. We also have steering angle, and that's, that's also helpful. But uh, using the shock pots uh, on a high aero car like this has absolutely been critical to the developing it. Otherwise, you know, you could, you could look at a bunch of different items and see where you're touching the ground, but until you, you get that and uh, figure out motion ratios, figure out wheel loading, uh, you're really just taking a shot in the dark and that's the last thing you want to be doing in a, an event like this is as you can tell uh, these cars don't last long so every every single lap that you can gather information and develop the car is absolutely critical. So you're using those shock pot sensors to essentially work out from the travel or the loading on the suspension how much downforce the car is generating? Oh absolutely yeah we're, we're able to get very accurate uh, downforce numbers uh, and figure out the balance of the car based upon that and that's it's just, this is an aero game now. Time Attack is absolutely an aero game and that's, uh, we couldn't imagine showing up here without him. Now, you've come from what is already a reasonably successful racing background. You've got another R35 GDR that's run at Pikes Peak. As you've just mentioned yourself, coming to World Time Attack, it is, uh, we've seen these cars develop over the last few years and it is very aero driven. What, uh, how did you go about developing an aero package for this car uh, coming here with something that was untested? How did you go about knowing that when you hit the track the aero package was going to be effective? Well we started with CFD analysis and that started with uh, Andrew Brilliant, our aerodynamicist. He, he came out, scanned the car and designed a package around uh, the car that we had and then built that package around some of the strengths in the shops as far as what we could build in-house. So uh, we started with uh, the CFD and that, that got us a good start, um, but he's here behind us today analyzing data and putting in a chassis simulator so uh, we can get everything out of the car um, because you know CFD gets you a good start, but what, what really happens on the tarmac is, is what you tune off of. So ultimately, all going well, you take that data from the car out on the track and then in conjunction with Andrew, you would then modify the aero package as, as need be? Absolutely, yep, yep. Can you give us some idea of what sort of downforce numbers this car is likely to produce at speed? Tons. Somewhat sensitive information? Uh, it's still in development. 
Again, this is very early and obviously you haven't had the best run so far at World Time Attack, so understandable. Now I just want to talk a little bit about the R35 GDR chassis. Obviously it's a, an amazingly sophisticated car uh, right off the showroom floor and it's seeing a lot of success in motorsport all around the world. Uh, it's, it's powerful, it's got a very sophisticated four-wheel drive system, however it is very heavy. So when you're competing against the likes of Tilton with their, their, their World Time Attack winning Evo, how much of a deficit does that weight disadvantage put you at? Uh, it's, it's fairly large. You know, we're four, five hundred kilos heavier than a lot of our competitors, which is just insane. Uh, and, you know, we, we knew what we were up against, and that's why we took everything really serious from uh, the amount of horsepower that we knew we needed to create to the amount of downforce that we knew we needed to create to, to try and hang with these guys. We're all on the same piece of rubber, so we, uh, we took big steps to, you know, build a competitive car. And uh, what sort of power did you feel that you needed going into this to be competitive? Uh, we were hoping to make 1,200. That, that's a big number. It is, it is. And we, uh, we, we started to turn up the boost and, you know, there's no, there's no dyno numbers on the asphalt, but there's quite a bit of drag with the aero package and so we needed to, you know, overcome that drag with, with quite a bit of horsepower and uh, we're not quite there yet. And I'm sure we will see it continue to develop and I look forward to seeing it uh, in the coming, coming years. But uh, can we talk about that engine package to make 1200 horsepower? What are you running in, in this car? We're running a stroked uh, 4 litre, uh, it was factory bore, um, with an AMS Alpha 10X power package, uh, so Garrett Base Turbos, and uh, they, they've, they've made 1,300 uh, on, on street cars, and understanding some of the loading we were going to be up against, we were realistic about getting 1,200 out of it, uh, and that's, that's, a, that's the same motor we've run on our Pike Speed car and made over 1,000 on that. Um, on the older style turbocharger. So uh, newer turbocharger, larger fuel system, uh, that's, that was going to give us what we needed to make the 1200. And what sort of boost pressure would you be needing to make that 1200 horsepower? In the 30s. And fuel, what, what fuel are you running it on? We run a VP Racing E85. And can we talk a little bit about the fuel system? Obviously that's pretty important. We want to make sure you keep that fuel up to an engine when it's running that sort of power and that sort of boost level. So what is the fuel system comprised of? Uh, we run a fuel safe fuel cell with a radium engineering built in surge tank, uh, ID 2000 injectors, uh, and three Walro 450 fuel pumps. It sounds like it, sh it should do the job. Uh, moving back a little bit to the transmission, it's a transaxle in these cars. I mean, that's one of the uh, most advanced parts of the R35 GDR, but uh, we've seen as well with some of the upgraded cars, it does also become uh, a weak point if it isn't upgraded accordingly. So what's been done to keep this transmission together? Dodson Motorsports stepped up big time this year and uh, we made the transition to their gear sets uh, and knew that the engineering was clearly better behind their product and uh, so we've been running their gear set for a short period of time and uh, they've provided great technical support and uh, a great product so we have zero failures on the Dodson components. When you're running one of these dual clutch transmissions with paddle shift, uh, the, the speed of the shift particularly uh, means that the engine's not going to drop off boost as much as we'd see with a conventional H pattern or even a sequential gearbox. Does that affect the turbo sizing that you can actually get away with and still make the car responsive out on the track? That is a factor, um, but we run a, a fairly small turbo in the big scheme of things um, with a, a stroked engine. So uh, keeping the turbo spooled hasn't been a, a, an issue for us. We have very similar spool to OEM because we're circuit racing. You know, the last thing you want to be do, doing is waiting for power to come on. So that, that was a big factor in this build is having a reasonably sized turbo that has quick uh, spool response. So essentially you've got a, a larger capacity engine, bigger turbochargers, but you're still getting a very fast spool, but with 1200 horsepower. That's exactly it. Now let's move back to that data, data package you've got on the car. So you've got the ADL3 and the M150 ECU. Uh, are you using one place as a central analysis point for all of that data, or are you pulling data from the ECU and the dash separately? We have CAN communication between the two, so we're able to pull uh, critical engine data, pull it on the dash. Uh, and, but when it comes to chassis side of things, we run everything through the ADL. So uh, we're essentially using the M150 uh, to 
shortcut some information over to the dash, get the critical bits over there. Uh, and we originally started with an OBD pickup on the ADL3, which was a pretty good way to do it uh, at that stage of the development of the car, and it worked really well. Uh, but as we progressed and needed more and more communication, more and more information, that's when we went to the CAN bus, and uh, it's worked out really well. And uh, in terms of the electronics as well, you're using a MoTeC power distribution module as well? Yes, we love the PDM. Okay, so what are you using that PDM to control and how is it being uh, operated in this, in this car? Uh, we run it for uh, switches, pumps, fans, uh, power breaker, it runs our electric power steering. It's, uh, we run it to switch different ignition maps on the fly, different tuning things. It's a very, very capable device that uh, I absolutely love. Definitely simplifies things and uh, the PDM as well, having that ability to uh, retry a circuit if it trips and fails is obviously essential if you want to get reliability out of your car. Now we know obviously the car's broken right now and uh, I understand from talking to, before, to you before that you're in the midst of trying to track down a, a stock replacement engine so uh, there's a chance we may still see this car running tomorrow? Absolutely, we're going to work through the night and get this thing on track. Uh, look, Cole, we wish you all the best. We know you guys have been working really hard to even get this car on the track over here. It's a real shame that it uh, hasn't gone so well for you so far, and uh, hopefully we can see it out there tomorrow. So good luck. Thanks for cheering us on. For online tuning courses, visit learntotune.com.